Canada is seriously considering high-speed rail, and it's about time. Canada's rail system has long been behind in the global race for fast, efficient travel. While the other G7 countries have been cruising along at breakneck speeds with their high-speed trains for decades, Canadians have been left navigating congested highways or dealing with endless airport delays. But the tide might finally be turning. After years of discussions, the federal government is seriously considering leaping into the future with a full-blown high-speed rail. Could this be the moment Canada catches up with the rest of the world? And why is it taking so long for Canada to get their first high-speed rail network? Let's find out in today's episode. Believe it or not, Canada was once quite the trailblazer in train tech. Back in the 1930s through the 1950s, they were all about those sleek, fast steam trains. The Canadian National 4600 and the Canadian Pacific Royal Hudson were doing a solid 90 to 110 miles per hour. But as with most things, good times couldn't last forever. Highways and planes started creeping in, offering faster, shinier ways to get around. And well, trains started to look a little slow. So what did Canada do? Naturally, they tried to keep up with the Americans. In the 60s, the US was throwing money at high-speed rail development, and they came up with this nifty little thing called the turbo train. The train hit a whopping 171 miles per hour in 1968. Not wanting to be left behind, Canadian National decided to jump on board and ordered their very own turbo train. This high-speed beauty made its debut on the Toronto-Montreal corridor in December 1969. But just an hour into its maiden voyage, it managed to collide with a truck. Still, the turbo train dusted itself off and kept on rolling, eventually setting a Canadian speed record of 150 miles per hour. That record still stands today. Fast forward to the mid-70s, and CN started rebranding its passenger services as Via Rail. By the late 70s, Via had become a crown corporation, meaning it took over not just CN's passenger services, but also Canadian Pacifics. And what did Via inherit? The turbo trains. These bad boys stayed on the tracks until 1982, when they were finally retired. But we weren't done yet. Enter the LRC train, short for light, rapid, comfortable. These new trains, which came onto the scene in the late 70s, were capable of hitting speeds of 125 miles per hour, but they mostly stuck to a humble 100 miles per hour during actual service. Oh, and they had a neat little trick. They could tilt while going around curves. And here's a fun fact. A few of these LRCs even made their way down to Amtrak in the US for testing. But spoiler alert, the Americans never bought any. Anyway, the LRCs were the real workhorses on the Windsor-Quebec City corridor until they were finally retired in 2001. This brings us to what could have been the Via Fast project. Imagine this, cutting travel time between Toronto and Ottawa to just over two hours and zipping between Ottawa and Montreal in just over an hour. Sounds dreamy, right? Well, VIA pitched this ambitious plan to the government in the 90s. It would have cost a cool 2.6 billion Canadian dollars to build the new tracks and infrastructure, but guess what? The project never got off the ground. Why? One word, politics. Turns out the Canadian Conservatives weren't too keen on the idea. So, when will we ever see a high-speed rail in Canada? Recently, VIA Rail has once again started their pipe dream, the High Frequency Rail Project. The nearly 1,000 kilometers high-frequency rail project was first proposed by VIA Rail to the Government of Canada in 2016. The plan? Dedicated rail corridors between Toronto and Ottawa, Montreal, and further up to Quebec City. The trains are expected to run at 125 miles per hour. But the real game-changer is the massive increase in frequency. This project's not just about making things faster. It's about giving Canada dedicated passenger tracks so they're no longer stuck sharing with freight trains. More tracks mean more trains, and we're talking three times the daily departures. Imagine cutting a trip from Toronto to Ottawa by up to 90 minutes. HFR is also all about on-time performance. Plus, it's bringing back stops at Trois-Rivières and Peterborough. New stations, better trips, and fewer delays. It's all in the works, and set to be done by 2030. It's one of the biggest infrastructure projects in Canadian history. We're talking at least hourly service or better. Plus, there's even talk of electrifying the line between Toronto and Ottawa, which is kind of a big deal. The price tag for the project? A casual $6 billion to $10 billion. For the procurement phase, with the government's help, the project secured $396.8 million to move it forward. Also, a new Crown Corporation was created in December 2022 to oversee key aspects like indigenous consultations and technical design work. In October 2023, the government launched the Request for Proposals RFP phase, inviting three consortia to submit their plans by summer 2024. 
These proposals will explore two main options, one for trains running at 124 miles per hour and another for segments of true high-speed rail for even faster travel times. But now, politicians are calling for true high-speed rail, as in 186 miles per hour or faster, because, hey, if you're going to dream, why not dream big? Originally, the HFR project was designed to improve train frequency along major stops like Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec City with a faster speed. But now, thanks to new evaluations, the government is seriously considering an option that could take speed beyond that, potentially bringing us our very first high-speed rail network with speeds exceeding 155 miles per hour. This would be a game changer for Canadian travel, especially considering that over 18 million people, almost half of Canada's population, live in this corridor. And it's not just VR rail in the game. Alberta has its own high-speed rail ambitions, and there's a study going on for a Portland-Seattle-Vancouver HSR corridor. Recently, a group of transit experts got together to figure out why Canada's still just dreaming about high-speed rail instead of, you know, building it. And the result of the discussion? Seriously complicated. We're talking about politics, Canadian culture, the logistics of the high-speed train and the gigantic cost. The experts are all basically saying, hey Canada, if you're serious about this, you're going to need to up your game. So why is Canada's high-speed rail still just a dream? Well, according to one expert, the main reason is alignment, meaning getting everyone on the same page, from local governments up to the federal level. And with something as big as high-speed rail, you can't have half the team cheering and the other half shrugging their shoulders. Canada needs a full, all aboard, from the federal government and the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. But guess what? They're never quite in sync. Sometimes we get two out of three aligned, one expert said, but that still wasn't enough to move forward. A little support here and there just won't cut it when you're trying to pull off a mega project like this. Then there's another big speed bump, Canada's love affair with cars. Canada is a car-centric country, especially in rural and suburban areas, where owning a car isn't just a luxury, it's a lifeline. Unlike places like Japan, where high-speed rail thrives thanks to lower car ownership and densely packed cities, Canada's spread out suburbs and reliance on cars mean fewer people are lining up to swap their car keys for train tickets. To put this into perspective, Canada saw a 7.9% increase in new vehicle registrations in the second quarter of 2024, with over 511,000 new motor vehicles hitting the roads. That's the highest number of registrations since 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic, according to Statistics Canada. Canada even ranks in the top 10 globally for vehicle registrations among 137 countries, so it's safe to say that cars aren't going anywhere soon. This car dependency isn't limited to long-term residents either. It's part of the newcomer experience too. Within their first month, about 32% of newcomers buy a car. Imagine landing in a new country, and one of the first things you do is head straight to the dealership. For many, especially those from regions with higher income, a car is essential. It's about mobility, access to opportunities, and settling into Canadian life. And even when it comes to environmental sustainability, one of the major motivators for Canada's high-speed rail, the country's car-centric culture is also shifting toward greener alternatives. Electric vehicles, EVs, and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PHEVs, are gaining traction. Specifically, in the second quarter of 2024, zero emission vehicles accounted for 12.9% of all new vehicle registrations, a notable increase from 10.1% the previous year. Canada's evolving auto market shows that while high-speed rail offers one path to reduce emissions, a shift within the car industry itself is also paving the way for a more sustainable future. One of the big voices in the debate pointed out a pretty huge flaw. Some of the proposed routes go way out of the way. Instead of a straight shot from Toronto to Quebec City, the train will swing through other stops as well. Sure, it's nice to include more cities, but it's not exactly the express route, is it? These scenic detours add time and completely defeat the purpose of high-speed rail, which is speed. But these indirect routes aren't just a minor hiccup, they raise big questions about whether anyone would use the thing. The whole point of high-speed rail is to be faster and easier than driving or flying. If your route is a winding, multi-stop journey designed to keep everyone happy, well, people might just stick with their cars or hop on a flight. On top of that, every extra stop or detour racks up costs. Building more stations, especially in low traffic areas, isn't cheap. It might be a political win to promise a station to every town along the way, but if no one's hopping on, it's a pricey gesture that doesn't add much value. 
Experts agree that to make high-speed rail work, you need to strike a balance. Sure, include some key stops, but don't overdo it. Prioritizing direct routes between major hubs is the best way to make high-speed rail fast, efficient, and worth the ticket price. Now for the biggest hurdles Canada's high-speed rail faces, the whopping price tag. Somewhere between 80 and 100 billion Canadian dollars. That's not just a one-time build-it-and-forget-it deal. According to the transportation expert, the costs pile up from day one and keep on coming with maintenance, operations, and upgrades to keep everything running smoothly. High-speed rail is the Cadillac of transit options, and it needs a budget to match. With a project this big, Canada needs a funding plan that doesn't just cover construction, but can handle the long-term bill. A realistic funding model that pulls from both public and private investments. Instead of diving headfirst into high-speed rail, the experts say we should start with high-frequency rail, HFR. Think of it as high-speed rail's little sibling. By upgrading existing tracks to handle more frequent trains, we can ease into a high-speed future without breaking the bank all at once. This phased model lets Canada build up the bones of a real rail network in stages, showing off the benefits early on, gaining support, and, best part, keeping costs from spiraling out of control. So we get better trains, more often, right now, while setting the groundwork for high-speed rail down the line. Smart, right? Community engagement is also the secret sauce here. Just ask Mayor Sean Panko of Smiths Falls. Since 2016, he's been banging the drum for rail service that actually benefits the people in his town. Every time the rail plans shift, like from HFR to high-speed rail, new questions and concerns pop up. People in smaller towns want access, jobs, and a chance to stay connected. For them, a local rail stop isn't just about convenience, it's about economic survival. When you get communities on board early, they're more likely to support the project and even fight for it. The lesson here? If you want people to get excited about high-speed rail, make sure it's built with them in mind. Think about it. Would you root for a new train line if it didn't stop anywhere near you? And finally, let's talk money. Expert mentioned that HFR was originally seen as the more realistic option because it doesn't make your wallet scream in agony. High-speed rail sounds amazing, but with price tags in the billions, we need funding that can keep the project afloat for years. So Canada needs a funding model that's not just a one-time deal, but covers the long haul, including operations and maintenance. Enter the Cadence Consortium, one of the major players in Canada's bid for high-frequency rail, HFR. Air Canada has recently jumped on board with Cadence, bringing a unique perspective from the aviation industry. With hubs in key cities like Toronto and Montreal, Air Canada is looking at HFR as a way to better integrate travel options for Canadians, aiming for a harmonious integration between air and rail in the Quebec-Windsor corridor. This would mean smoother connections for travelers and a more cohesive transit network. Cadence isn't the only consortium in the running, but it's the only one backed by an airline, making it an interesting mix of partners. Alongside Air Canada, there's the French high-speed rail operator SNCF Voyageurs, CDPQ Infra, Sistra Canada, Atkins Realis Canada, and Keolis Canada, all bringing expertise in infrastructure, rail operations, and financing. So what do you think? Can Canada pull it off? Or is this one train that's just never leaving the station? Thanks for tuning in today. Subscribe, and we'll see you next time.